Muslim apologetics are a relatively new thing. In the West, Christians have had to defend their beliefs against the rising tide of secularism for at least a couple hundred years, and they've gotten pretty good at it. But Muslims have very close societies, usually by comparison. The Middle East, for example, Christian proselytizing is banned there. Atheists are very often mistreated and not allowed to be open. Converting from Islam to another religion is often punishable by the highest of penalties. So, in the Islamic world, they just haven't had to deal with apologetics like Christians have, so they're very new at it. And their apologetic style is a little bit different accordingly. So today we're going to do something a little bit different and take a look at some Muslim apologetics. In the video we are about to watch, this man was asked a question by another man. He was asked, how do you prove religion, heaven and hell, to somebody who doesn't believe? Because the questioner himself identifies as non-religious. This is the response, so let's check it out and see where it goes. Well, that's the question that, how do I know that hell and heaven? How will a common man believe? I don't believe in a religion. Okay, before he goes into what is a religion, let's look at the actual definition of religion according to the Oxford Dictionary. The belief in and worship of a superhuman power or powers, especially a god or gods. A particular system of faith and worship a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. It's important to actually get the definitions down early because they like to play with words and their meanings quite a lot. So let's proceed and see how he defines it. Brother, what is the definition of religion? Religion is a way of life. How you lead your life. Many people say that I don't mind, I'm just a human being, I'm born, I will do test and error, and I will know how to lead a life. For example, you go to a forest, you are going to a forest the first time. You don't know whether the fruits are poisonous or not. If you start eating any fruit, you may end up eating a fruit which is poisonous and you may die. What do you do? You ask an expert. Right or wrong? And of course, our expert is this man and people like him. Now, of course, if you are non-religious, you are not convinced this man is an expert. But let's see where this goes. When you get sick, who do you go to, brother? When you are sick, who do you go to? Why? The doctor is an expert in treating sickness, correct? You can't say, I am a human being, I will treat myself. No. That's what the Quran says in Surah Nahal. So, what he's saying is essentially that the experts of the deeper questions of meaning and life and the universe all go back to religion, that the Quran is a document of expertise written by the experts in these things. And of course, again, if you are not religious, you are not convinced that is the case. The Quran says in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter 21 verse number 7, Fas alu ahal zikri in kuntu la talamun. If you don't know, ask the person who is expert. Similarly to lead a life, we have to ask the expert. Now who is the expert? Who is the expert? The person who created us. Who created well, again, if we are not religious, the whole point is we don't believe in your expert. We don't believe that there is a person who created us that we can ask the expertise of. That's a pretty big problem. And it does, it's Almighty God. So we have to follow the commandment of Almighty God. If you do not believe in Almighty God, you should listen to my video cassette, Is the Quran God's Word, where I've proved logically and scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are Let's actually check that out at some point, but I must note the premise of this video is that Dr. Zakir Nayak scientifically and logically proves to an atheist the existence of hell and heaven. So I'm hoping he goes into some of this scientific proof very soon. An atheist? Are you an atheist, brother? Are you an atheist? Pardon me? Are you an atheist? No, no. Not an atheist. So what do you, do you believe in God? Actually, I believe in the power, but Fine, that means you believe in God. So you I want to call it power, you want to call it... He did call himself non-religious. I suppose he's not an atheist, but he's not exactly a believer in Allah or whatever. So, let's, let's see where this goes. I'm very interested to see how this dialogue unfolds. Normally, uh, people like Zakir are a lot more hostile. He seems not so hostile so far, but you never know how this stuff is going to go. Supernatural, you believe in God. It's like, I believe something. Something. You don't is, know the name. That name is God. 
<laughs> you may call it power, you may call it anything. How scientific? Uh, see, there are models of reality that include supernatural forces that we don't call God. For example, pantheism. Pantheism, technically you could say it is inclusive of a godlike concept, but it's very different than the definitions of God this person would use. The pantheist God, for example, is everything. It's the laws of the universe. It's the universe. It's every atom that makes up the whole universe. That together is what we call God, which is a very different idea. So the way he's trying to make it seem like there is one essential idea of God is just very unfair. If you don't believe in God, then you listen to my video cassette is the Quran God's word. If you don't know who that power is, yet you listen to my cassette is the Quran God's word, where I've proven scientifically. I this guy is really interested in promoting his cassette. I wonder how much he's selling it for. Undoubtedly, existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Quran is the word of Almighty God. Now coming to your question, if you say about power, that means you believe in a religion. Because religion by definition, according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means a belief in a supernatural controlling power. Power word is there. Okay, so I gotta say, I do respect the guy for quoting the same source I quoted. I was not expecting that. He did play around with the, the definition of religion earlier. But I gotta give people credit where credit is due, and I think some credit is due here. So good on him. Uh, good job, Dr. Sakir. I'm, I'm very happy you did that. That means you believe in a religion. Religion, according to Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a supernatural controlling power, a personal god or gods that deserve obedience and worship. Well, that is not actually uh, the idea of God altogether. There are different kinds of God, like the founding fathers of the United States were heavily influenced by the French Revolution and that sort of thing. And they believed in, a lot of them believed in a deist God, which is a creator God that created the universe and then just left, which, honestly, that'd probably be the smart thing to do. It would explain a lot, since the universe just seems to work the same way, whether or not there is a god. I mean, if there isn't a god, the universe works the same way you would expect it to work. Um, if there is a god, it works like that anyway. So, a deist god, probably a pretty good idea, actually. That means you believe in religion, you don't know the definition of religion. So don't say, I don't believe in religion. Religion is English word, brother. Religion is English word. If you open the Oxford Dictionary, it says religion means a belief in a superhuman controlling power and you believe in a power. I don't like how he's just like sticking on definitions here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip ahead to a part where he actually talks more in depth about his particular arguments. I'm asking a simple question. Is robbing good or bad? Bad, I would say, personally. Robbing is good or bad? Robbing is bad. Bad. Yeah. Raping a girl is good or bad? No. Definitely bad. No, no, bad. Bad, bad. Okay, now, I'm asking you a question. Logically, I suppose happen to be the biggest mafia. Hypothetically. I'm a big robber. You prove to me logically and scientifically. I'm a very logical person. I'm a scientific person. I am a logical person and scientific person. You prove to me why robbing is bad for me, and I will stop robbing. Well, okay, here's how I can do that. Um, so, you would not want to be robbed, correct? I don't think I would want to be robbed. Therefore, it is bad to rob other people. You would not want it to happen to you. Therefore, you shouldn't want it to happen to anybody else. That's pretty simple. That's pretty clear cut. You don't need to appeal to God. You don't need to appeal to some sense of morality. All you need is to know, I wouldn't want it to happen to me. So I shouldn't be doing it to anybody else. That simple. Only one reason you give me, one good reason why robbing is bad for me, and I will stop robbing. It hurts others. It hurts people. It there we go. Great reason. Fantastic. Already. It hurts others. What difference does it make to me? If it hurts, if I rob, if I rob a thousand riyal, it is benefiting me. I can see movie. I can go to a five-star hotel. What difference does it make whether it hurts others? Does it hurt me? Yes, I think it does hurt you. The Stoics, and I hate to talk about the Stoics because there's so much pop Stoicism out there, but I do think Stoic logic can be kind of important. The Stoics believed that virtue was the highest good. Now, they justified this with the old gods, but I think there is a case to be made for it that doesn't necessarily include gods. I think that when you do something wrong to somebody else, you are essentially the one being hurt by it. Let's say I have something you want and you take it from me. You just, you come and you take it by force. I have been 
wronged in the sense that I no longer have something that was mine. But the real damage is done to the person that took the thing from me, because they have now the character of a robber, of somebody who steals from other people, somebody who hurts other people carelessly. And I do think that is bad, and I don't think we need religion to say that is bad. But yes, it does hurt you. It's not just hurting me if you steal something from me, it's hurting you, because it's making you into a worse person. And what happens when you're a worse person? Well, a lot of the time, that does come back on you. So even in the, even in the name of self-interest, it should be self-evidently bad to steal things from other people. I told you proof to me why it is bad for me, not for others. I am least bothered about the others. Why is it bad for me? When I'm robbing thousands, if it hurts him, no problem. What difference does it make to me? If it hurts somebody else, does it make a difference to me? I no doubt he thinks a good reason to not rob people is because God says it's wrong. But I don't think that's really a logical answer. Like, he says he's all about logic and reason. But really, just because God says so, I don't think is a good answer. God says it's wrong. Okay, so what? I say it's right. I can do the same thing he's doing here. I mean, if he wants to say that empathy doesn't matter, if he wants to say that virtue and character doesn't matter, then I could say, well, whatever God wants doesn't matter. And what about what I want? Who cares what God wants? I can enjoy, I can see movie. I can eat chicken biryani. I asked you, give me one logical reason why it is bad for me, not why it is bad for others. I'm a big mafia. I'm powerful. I'm a scientific person, logical person. Prove to me one good reason, logical, why robbing is bad, I will stop robbing. Come on, another try, brother. I want him to prove to me why a robber should stop robbing because God says so. That's what I want to hear, but I suspect we won't be hearing that. Another try. One more try. Why it is bad? I like how the... The one guy looks, I mean, Zakir looks like uh, very smug, like, oh yeah, I got you now, buddy, I got you now. And this non-religious guy is just like, I cannot believe the nerve of this guy to think he has me right now. Like, just because you answered his question with sarcasm and by just invalidating his point does not mean that he does not have a point. And I think from the look on his face, he knows he has a point. No answer. No answer you would accept, Zakir. No answer. Try, try. There are 20, 30 reasons, 100 reasons you can give. You know, actually, as you said, the religion means the way of life. Not religion. Why robbing is bad? Tell me. Don't go to religion. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming to the point. No, not point. First, tell me why robbing is bad. We'll come back to your point afterwards. I'll come to your point afterwards. When that yes. is the way of life. Not way of life. Tell me why robbing is bad according to you. Why it is bad for me, I will stop robbing. Why does he get to make all the terms of this discussion? Why can't he be asked questions also? Because currently it's a one-way street. I think if you're going to have a discussion like this, it should go something like this. You, Zakir, ask a question of this man, and then he answers, and whether or not you accept that answer, he should be able to ask you something in return. You can't just keep asking him the same question over and over and badger him to say the same, or to answer the same question over and over, and just like, that's not how you have a debate or a discussion. That's how you try to make a fool of somebody. And that's just not a good way to debate. I understand why he's doing it. Obviously, with stuff like this, you want to appeal to the crowd. You want to make your opposition look like an idiot. But I think what we should be going for here is truth. And I think he would agree. But the way he debates does not really flow from that logically. To me, you know, it hurts others. So, but you know what difference does it make to me when it hurts others? Does it hurt me? Of course, you know, why once... Why it is bad for me, not why it is bad for others. Once we come to the society, you know, we have to face, face them. Okay, once we come to the society, you have to face them. I'm facing them, I'm facing them, what is what? Why it is bad for me? The society won't respect us. What difference does it make whether respect or not? I can eat chicken biryani, I can... Go I think this is also telling because it points out something that we atheists have been pointing out for a while. If you need God to tell you not to do something bad, that's a problem. You are a bad person. Um, I do not need a cosmic dictator telling me not to rob people or do other terrible things to them because I have empathy. I am a human being. I can put myself in other people's shoes and understand why I should not do bad things to them. 
The fact that this guy can't seem to put himself in my shoes and understand that perspective is frankly terrifying. It's terrifying for him because it really tells you what kind of a person he is. Religious people, I have to ask, do you honestly think it's a good idea to go on stage and say, if I didn't believe in God, I would be a robber, I would be a mafia boss, I would be a hitman. Do you really think that is the best way to go about making your case? Do you really think that makes you look good or honorable or respectable or, or reasonable? Because I don't. I'm going to a movie, I can go to a five-star hotel. What difference does it make to be if society respects or not? Imagine someone respects society. The poor person doesn't have food to eat. He'll be happy? No. You require food to eat or not? You require food to survive? Only society respect in the person is starving to death. You know, in India, thousands of people are starving to death. What difference does it make? I must give me one go I think it makes a big difference. I don't want to see anybody starve to death because I have had to go without food. And in a major way, actually, I mean, one time I couldn't afford any food and the food banks were kind of like closed because it was like a really small area where there was just like nothing. And I really suffered. I mean, I lost like 60 pounds um, very quickly because of it. And it was terrible. And I know what it's like to starve. I know what it's like to feel your body eating itself. I know what it's like to, to understand that you are being eaten away by your own body, that your body has such a need for energy that it is taking your muscles and your bones and everything in you and trying to turn you into food to survive, in a sense. That is a terrible feeling, and I wouldn't want that to happen to anybody alive. So you say, well, why should I care? And I say, because you wouldn't want it to happen to you. Good reason why robbing is bad, I stop robbing. Why is it bad for me? Can anyone else help him out? Why robbing is bad? Why robbing is bad? And of course, I mean, look at all the, the smug faces in the crowd here. These people look very entertained. Like, I mean, look at all these smiles in the audience. Like, these looks of just, yeah, you're killing him, man. And I guess that's easy to do if you're the one leading the thing and have the microphone, but the whole setup is just really unfair. There are many underworld people in India and the law can't do anything to them. The law is in their pocket. But yet, you as a common man, don't you think you should be punished? Raping is good or bad. There are many people who rape. They rape the girls. No, nothing. The law cannot catch them. So don't you think he should be punished? Yes or no? Yes. But there are many people you see in this world who are big mafias, they die comfortable, they are rich, they are millionaires. There should be some justice. The reply is given by a creator. Sulay Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185. Allah says, Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. So the argument he is making here is that because bad things happen in this life and go unpunished, there has to be a next life where these things are punished. I have heard this sort of thought from Muslims quite frequently, that there has to be some retribution, there has to be some revenge in the next life for these very bad people, the Hitlers, those sorts of characters. But I don't think there does. The universe may just be, as it seems to be, an unfair place. There is no guarantee that people who do bad things won't just get away with them. Now, I think there is a final equalizer. I think the final equalizer is just death, that every person alive will eventually die. You do not get away with your crimes forever. There is no God on the other side waiting to punish you for them. But you will still meet the same fate as the lowliest person alive, as all of your victims do. So in that sense, we are all equal in death, which is not an uncommon thought. But the universe does not exist to satisfy us and our need for justice and retribution. The universe does not exist to please us or make us happy. The universe just is. The fact that people get away with bad things does not mean there is another life in which they will be punished, and I think this is a silly argument, but I understand that he's trying to make it sound logical, reasonable, rational, because it feels good to him, which is kind of ironic. But let's continue. Let's see what else he has to say. This life is the mere chattels of deception. If there is no life after death, this life is of injustice. What we say... 
Well, that is correct. This life is of injustice, and it sucks, but that's just how it works. And the total justice would be on the Day of Judgment. Our Creator Almighty God will give justice. I tell the person, fine, you may be a big... You know, the Christians say that too. The Jewish people say that too. Any number of religions make that claim, and your religion is not special for that claim. So the question then becomes, you have a religious book that says you are correct. The Jewish people have a religious book that says they're correct. The Christians have one that say they're correct. Other religions have ones that say they're correct. You can't all be right. So why should I believe yours over theirs? You believe in yours, they believe in theirs, you're all pretty strong in your faith, you all know your stuff very well. What reason do I have to believe yours over theirs? For example, you are that mafia, now I am a Muslim. No one can harm you, police in your pocket, and then ask you, justice is required, yes. If someone robs you, no one can rob you, agree. But don't you feel there should be justice? There are many robbers, there are many evils, there are many criminals who go scot-free. What I feel does not determine what reality is. I think this is an important thing to point out here, that with religious people, they'll say, I'm going to scientifically and logically prove to you that my religion must be true. But then they just say, like, I feel like there should be justice in the universe. I feel like bad people should get theirs in the next life. You can feel like that, but that doesn't make it the case that it's going to happen that way. Unless there is life after death. You cannot prove robbing is bad. You cannot prove raping is bad. Unless there's life after death, no humanity, no book on humanity. No Mother Teresa, no Mahatma Gandhi can prove robbing is bad. And yet, secular societies are often the most happy and the most safe, which seems like a pretty big conundrum. If you think about the Middle East, it's always in conflict over something. I mean, usually religion, but... There are other things. Obviously, geopolitics plays a role that uh, the Middle East is used as kind of like a staging ground for all these proxy wars between the United States, NATO, Russia, whoever. But a lot of conflicts in the Middle East do come from religion. And so it seems like religion is a big source of negativity in the world. In countries that are less religious, there is less of that. I mean, you don't see holy wars breaking out in modern Europe, which is a lot more secular and anti-religion than it used to be. You know, I, I say anti-religion, but what I mean by that isn't just like they're like saying no religion, religion bad. What I mean is they are not religious. They do not fight religious wars. Uh, funnily enough, it seems like the only people willing to fight religious wars on uh, European soil are Muslims. Now, that is not to say that all Muslims are bad, I don't think they are. I think that is just oversimplification. But I will say that if someone is trying to start a holy war on European territory, it's probably not going to be a secular person or a milk toast Christian like has taken over the continent aside from the secular people and Muslims. So when it comes down to it, how can you really say that religion provides a good guide against being a bad person when it seems like the most religious places have the highest abundance of just bad people. Without the concept of life after death. Because I'm asking a question. Hitler, history tells us Hitler insinuated six million Jews. How many Jews? Six million. Well, I'm glad he's not a Holocaust denier. That's always something good. I bet there are people in the crowd, though, that are like, wait a second, buddy. Six million. Suppose the law catches Hitler. What punishment can you give Hitler so that you can compensate for? He has burnt six million Jews alive. I am not a big fan of retribution. Now, I would agree that for somebody like Hitler, you can't rehabilitate that, and it would probably be unethical and immoral to do so. There are certain crimes that rehabilitation becomes pointless. If you capture Hitler, the best option is probably just to you know, give him the, the final penalty for what he has done. Um, or life. I mean, you could really give somebody a terrible life in prison if you really wanted to punish them. But yes, it would not make up for the countless lives lost. In fact, I don't think there is anything you could possibly do to an Adolf Hitler that would be enough. Um, Eternal Hellfire, I don't think would be enough because you're not really giving him what he gave. He can never feel the punishment. Now, Eternal Hellfire obviously is not a good thing, 
And I'm sure he wouldn't like it a whole lot. But I don't think that that even itself is sufficient if we're talking about retribution and justice. He is not experiencing all the tortures and torments that his victims faced. So I don't think that it's even a good model for retribution and such. But I also don't have this aching need for retribution. I think death equalizes all. So even if somebody gets away with things in life, that is obviously terribly unfair. But they don't get away with it forever. That's just what I think. Can you give him any punishment? Brother. We have to put him in jail till his life death. Okay, will it be equivalent to burning six million Jews? Is burning better or putting in jail better? It's burning is, of, of course. course. So Mac I don't think it's better. I, you know, here's the thing about like hell and the idea of hell. I think I would not want anybody to burn forever. I think I would not want a single person to burn for eternity because that's still a person regardless of what else they've done. In Hitler's case, sure, maybe give him, you know, um, six million years. Hell, six billion years, why not? Uh, but forever seems a bit much, even for Hitler. There is a point past which all the suffering he has imparted is effectively paid off, and it may be well before six million years. I mean, burning sounds bad for any amount of time, let alone six million years. Um, so I don't have this aching need to see people punished in the way he wants to. And Nietzsche said something like, never trust those in whom the impulse to punish is strong. And as history has shown, that's a pretty good rule to live by. You should not trust people who really want nothing more than to punish other people for their sins or crimes or whatever else. It's perfectly fine to want people to pay for crimes in some sense, but if somebody is all about punishment and wants a lot of people to suffer for their sins, I think that is bad. I think that says something really negative about a person. It says something, frankly, psychopathic. Maximum you can do is burn him alive, but that will be equal to one out of six million. What about- This is some like ISIS shit he's talking about. That makes me pretty uncomfortable. What about the remaining five million, 999,999 people? What about that? What if you can like burn one person alive, you can probably do it to a lot more people for a lot less than what Hitler did. I'm just saying. What justice is your Lord going to do? But the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 56, as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them in the hellfire, and as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. Okay, that is psychopathic, that is evil, and the fact that anyone would look upon such a scenario with glee is horrific. This is terrible and terrifying, and people like this should terrify all of us. If Hitler killed six million Jews, Allah says, he can put him into hellfire and give him fresh skin again six million times. Allah can burn him. Not here, in the year after, in the hell. Okay, so I think we're at the end of his argument. It's not exactly the end of the video, but this is more or less the end of his argument. And if I have any final thoughts here, it's just that I told you it would be bad. I told you that Muslim apologetics are not in a good place. And this example is especially silly and weak. But I assure you, this is actually pretty normal for Muslim apologetics. We will cover more. We will find some that are a little bit better. But even the best Muslim apologetics these days falls very far short of the best Christian apologetics, which is already a pretty low bar outside of certain people like William Lane Craig. Now, if there's one more thing I want to say here, it's that I am disturbed by all of the retribution talk and the burning alive or burning dead, as it were. I am frankly horrified by that. I think that's horrific. I don't think anybody should want such a thing. That is the stuff of like horror movie villains. That is some Saw shit. Actually, Saw probably wouldn't even be malicious enough to do that. I think it would be very interesting if people like this would take a step back and reflect on the character of someone who would do that to someone else. He did talk about that sort of thing, the burning happening to people who just reject the words of the Quran. I don't think rejecting the words in a book that has no evidence to back it up is a reason to cast somebody into eternal fire, burn off their skin over and over. I think that is evil, and I think any god that would do that is evil. So I wish they'd take a step back and see that, but I doubt they will, and 
honestly, I probably shouldn't say stuff like that because, you know, I think of like Salman Rushdie, but I guess you got to speak, even if it's dangerous. I hope you have a good day, though.